here we are, God, vessels, I pray, empty vessels. If we are not, will you tip us over, empty us of ourselves and fill us up with and by your spirit. Put in us what we need in this hour that you will get glory in this place. This is your word. We are your people. Speak to us. We're listening. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Mark 9, verses 14 through 29 have been read to us. If you're not comfortable talking about demonic spirits and exorcisms, Mark 9 is a hard read. And I warn you that some of my thoughts for these verses, some of my applications, might prove to be a little uncomfortable as well. I believe the spirit realm is real, and I believe it is active. And I believe that we do ourselves an injustice, a disservice when we attempt to gloss over that truth. In this passage, a demon is in a boy, and in this passage, his dad wants it out. Let's look at how Jesus helped the boy and how he can help us as well as we discover some things about ourselves in this story. Let's look at our valleys. We can find that portion of verse 14 and a portion of verse 17. A little bit of 14 reads, when they came to the disciples, a little bit of verse 17 reads, someone from the crowd answered him. Now, just before this encounter that we have in front of us in Mark 9, verses 14 through 29, just before this encounter, there was the transfiguration. There was a heavenly, supernatural change in the being of Jesus. There was a cross-dimensional conversation between Jesus and Elijah and Moses. And we have God the Father speaking, not in a wind or in the thunder, but speaking with clarity. All of this to be witnessed by Peter, James, and John. So amazing was this revelation that Peter wanted to stay right there. He said, let's build an altar, let's worship, let's not abandon this once-in-a-lifetime experience. Y'all listen, that was verses 1 through 13. And then Peter, James, and John exit the mountain. And the first thing they return to is arguing, and chaos, and desperation, and sickness, and sadness. A minute ago, the sweetness of being alone with Jesus on the mountain. And now this, what can we learn? Enjoy the mountain, because the valleys are waiting. Being with Jesus is awesome and necessary and beautiful and required and it is honorable, but we spend time with Jesus so we can ready ourselves to serve others. We are with him to know that we are loved and forgiven. And then we go out into the world 
to love and forgive others. We are with him to recognize and know our needs. And then we go out into the world to try to meet the needs of others. Then we have our identity. Now, a particular point, a, a, a theme has been coming up with me very clearly in the last few sermons that I've preached here. And it's been difficult for me to ignore these reminders, these little indicators in the passages that I've read and preached that keep echoing about our connection and our relationship with Jesus. This overlap, this intimate overlap of who we are in relationship to our relationship to God the Father, God the Son, God Holy Spirit. In the summer, we celebrated uh, our place in this hidden kingdom. We looked at the fact that though there might be a seed now, because we are in him, we talked about how exponential growth has been guaranteed. And just the last time I was before you, we were looking at Mark 6, and I looked at and I thought about and we talked about how we should know ourselves in him. We talked about how the disciples were going off into a desolate place and the masses, the people, saw them and recognized their connection with Jesus. And the Bible says the people followed the disciples. And no surprise, in this passage, for the third time, Holy Spirit again highlights the way that we are inextricably laced into our Lord. You said, CJ, hurry up, tell us where it is. Verse 17, someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you. Remember what we know. Verses 1 through 13, Jesus was on the mountain. Verse 14, Jesus came down the mountains to meet with the disciples. Verse 17, I brought my son to you. Jesus had every right to say, who, who me? You must be mistaken because you didn't bring, I just came off of the mountain. But the father would continue to speak and make it clear for us. Later on, he would say, I asked your disciples to cast out the demon, and they could not. The father viewed the disciples' connection with Jesus to be so intricately woven together that though he actually took his son to the disciples, he said, I brought my son to you. We're so thrilled when we are told that we look like someone so famous, so beautiful, so popular. We, we have our confidence just shoot through the roof when someone says, ooh, you look like Brad Pitt, Denzel Washington. Hasn't been said about me. <laughs> you look like Taylor Swift, Beyonce. I think we do well to live for the day when people would tell us, you know that thing you did that looked just like Jesus? That way that you acted, that reminded me of Jesus. Now let's look at our gifting. We find that in verses 18 through 19. I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he, being Jesus, answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Some commentators believe that Jesus was talking only to the Father and to the crowd. Others believe that Jesus was including the disciples in this rebuke as well. In fact, if he was talking to, and if he did include the disciples in this, he was probably thinking back to something he had told them in Mark 3. Now, y'all, we are in Mark 9, right? But in Mark 3, verses 14 through 15, 
And he appointed the twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority over demons. So if he was talking to the disciples, he could have said, guys, I told y'all you can do this. But we can look at what he may have said to the dad. We can look at what he may have said to the disciples. We can look at what he may have said to the crowd. But what I want us to think about is, what is he saying to us? In those few verses, what might Jesus be saying to us? What can we learn from those verses? Yes, yes, yes. We just went over the fact that I want us to celebrate our identity and our connection with Jesus. I'm not going to apologize for that. We should be so close to Jesus that we should look like him. People should make the mistake to think that we are him. But we dare not let someone, anyone, even if their intentions are good, make us feel bad and ashamed because of where we are in our faith journey. Now, I'm not saying that the Father did this, but he made a statement, guys, that it stung a little bit when I read it. I asked them to cast out the Spirit, but they could not. Sounds like he was blaming them or throwing them under the bus. There are too many folks who come to church, and I'm not talking about this church specifically. I'm talking about the church in general. They come to believers, and they dump their issues in our laps. And the expectation is, because you are a Christian, you must be able to fix this, repair this, pay this, answer this, solve this, do this. I warn you, be discerning. Be mindful of this, or you will feel defeated and crushed and inadequate when you can't do in your season what somebody desperately needs you to do in their season. Did you hear me? We can and we must always love, forgive, be kind, share your faith. Do the things that are within God's will for our lives. Do the things that align with his character. Do the things that square with how he has called us and gifted us. But in some things, we, like other folks, need to say, I'm sorry, but I'm still in process. He's still working on me. There are ways that you are equipped and gifted and called And they may not be the answer for another person's problems. They may be in a season where they need planting. And you might just be watering. They may need to be watered. And you might be in a season where God has called you to plant. Remember, God is perfecting you. He's still maturing you. He's still completing you. Don't be so hard on yourself. Quick thought. The Father is to be commended, first, for his persistence. After an unsuccessful exorcism with the disciples, he went to Jesus asking for help a second time. He didn't give up on his boy. A second commendable thing that the dad did, he didn't let his feelings and his emotions get the best of him. The father appealed to Jesus. And y'all, it seems like Jesus went off on that man. (laughs) Jesus, can you cast the demon out of my son? Oh, faithless and twisted generation. How long am I going to be with you? How long am I going to bear with you? Too often, we can't stomach a harsh rebuke or stern criticism leading us to storm off for the next possible plan or to the next potential solution. When we petition God and his initial response is not what we expect, when it's not what we desire, we need to put a muzzle on our emotions and trust his 
plan for us. Trust that he is God and trust that he is good because that dad hung around, because that dad didn't get in his feelings, because that dad took that rebuke from Jesus. I could just see him standing there. Jesus said, bring me the boy. Don't abandon your ask. If you've been on the wall a long time waiting for an answer, and it seems like God's response is not lining up to what you want, handcuff yourself to his heart and say, I'm waiting. I'm not moving. Next thought is our enemy. Jesus, verses 25 and 26, Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to him, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he is dead. Please, please, please. Do not think that I am belittling our Savior or suggesting anything concerning him that has to do with lack or weakness. Don't think that. But verses 25 and 26 is not talking about the disciples. It's not talking about the seven sons of Sceva. Verse 25 and 26, we're told that Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the one who proclaimed, and I believe, I got all power in the palm of my hand, Jesus rebuked the demon, saying, come out of him and never enter him again. Jesus gave the command, and the Bible says, After Jesus said it, the demon shook the boy so violently, so terribly that he looked like a corpse to the extent that people looked on and said, he's dead. The shaking happened after Jesus gave the command to come out. I read this, and I was struck by a thought that I couldn't shake, no pun intended. And I'm about to share the thought with you. And I'll just tell you, this may not be for everyone. But I believe that somebody in here knows what I'm talking about. Someone in here has experienced what I'm talking about. Many of us have things in our lives that we know that we know, that we know, that we know that God has spoken into our lives, that God has spoken over our lives. Things that we are believing by faith will come to pass. We have confidence in what God has assured us of concerning this thing. Maybe something like this venture will be blessed, and this marriage will succeed. And this thing will prosper. And this thing will live and not die. God has spoken. And the thing that is supposed to be alive looks dead. The thing that is supposed to be good right now looks so, so bad. Jesus, the command went forth. And his command was going to be obeyed. But the enemy was in the intermission. If I'm talking to you like I'm talking to myself, the encouragement is for you to hold on. Even if everything about the situation and everyone around you is looking in, saying, you think that... Is going to live? You think that is going to survive? Hold on. Because the enemy is fighting. 
to not let us see on earth what's already settled in heaven. We see a powerful example of that in Daniel 10. I'll share it. Ah. Ten. Daniel 10, we have Daniel. In the first couple of verses in Daniel 10, the Bible tells us that he's praying and he's fasting. The Bible tells us in Daniel 10 that Daniel is praying and fasting in the year of King Cyrus of Persia. And the Bible says that for 21 days, He's not eating anything. He's mourning and fasting and he's praying for three weeks. That's what the Word of God tells us. Then the Bible continues to tell us that while Daniel is fasting and praying for three weeks, an angel appears to Daniel, so magnificent and so glorious in its appearance. And Daniel said, I fell to my knees, trembling. And the angel took him by the hand and said, stand up. I came to deliver a message to you. From the moment you set your heart to be humble and to cry out to God, from the moment you began to seek an answer to the vision, I was told to come and bring you the answer. I just told you Daniel was praying for three weeks, fasting for three weeks, The angel said, 21 days I left to come and bring you this answer, but a demon withheld me, the prince of Persia. I've been fighting with a demon to give you the answer to the prayer that you are seeking God for, but for 21 days, a demon stopped me from getting the answer. Michael, the archangel angel, had to come and fight. Right now, Michael's back there doing business with the demon. But I came to tell you that it's already done. It's already settled. You've been fasting and I've been fighting. The devil doesn't want you to know that from the time you set your affections to hear, 21 days you've been fasting, 21 days I've been fighting. The enemy is fighting to not let us see on earth what is already settled in heaven. It's done. The moment God said it, it was yours. Let's pray. This is your word, and we are your people. Speak to our hearts, God. Amen.